with authority. Welcome, everybody. It's another edition of the With Authority podcast, Quarantine Edition. Larry Deal, Casey Pratt, Chris Alvarez, special guest, Warriors Center Marquise Chris, who only moments ago was basking outside. I was going to say, I wish <laughs> I was with you. Uh, you have this outdoor patio feel. I envision waterfalls and misters <laughs> and all things going off uh, in Phoenix. But how are you doing? I'm good. I can't complain. Just trying to stay in there, stay healthy. It's a good goal for everybody. All right, so we're going to get into the, the whole story of your journey, which really, it could take an hour just to do all the transactions <laughs> and everything in, in, in four short years. But I want to go off the board here to start uh, with a question that I know you have not been asked in any interview in the last couple of years. Are you ready? I'm ready. You're ready. I think I'm ready. I hope. Okay. All right. Buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up on that beautiful leather couch. Uh, because we're all dealing with quarantine diets and trying to figure out, you know, to try not to get too far out of shape and all that. And obviously, as a professional athlete, that's important for you. So I ask you this. When was the last time that you had a Pizuki? Wow. Oh. To be honest, maybe like a week and a half ago, I made one at my house. Uh, I wish it was more recent, but I can't eat those too much. They're not very good for you, so I try to limit as much as I can. But I'm a, I, I like sweet spots, so that's that's where my problem is. We should talk about because a lot of people I didn't know what a pizuki was until I looked yeah. it up. So can you describe? Because I know you you've made them from scratch, and yeah. so uh, it's. It's all things sugar, but but give us your pizuki recipe. Um, mine is really just I buy like these bags. Uh, I forgot what it's called. It might be the McCormick, um, like the cookie dough bags, and then you just put it in a in a bowl and you mix it up. You put like the water and the oil and the eggs um, and some butter, but then you just you have to cook it like. I don't know. Honestly, I don't even really put it on a timer. I just put it in there and I just watch it and let it like fluff up. And then I take it out and it sounds weird, but I kind of bang it on the counter. Like I just drop it so that the cookie flattens. Um, and then I'll put it back in there and let it cook more just so it's like kind of crunchy. But that's how I like my cookies. I like kind of crunchy, but uh, you just put some ice cream on top of it or whatever you want. You just It's a lot of sugar, but it's definitely worth it. So it's like a, almost like a, it's a cookie in the shape of a pizza with ice cream on top of that. Yeah. And that's. Yeah. If if uh, if I were to eat a lot of pizukis, that would be my path to the NBA. Is that safe to say? Nah, I don't no. think it's for everyone. I don't think it's for everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, let me jump in with this, man. I know that you're in Arizona right now, and you've been staying extra safe. But being a Sacramento native, how much time have you gotten to spend with your family? Have you have you been able to see your family? And uh, I know you've been working out in the Sacramento area too. Yeah, um, I see my family pretty often. Uh, I, I went up there right before I left, actually. My sister just graduated college. Excuse me. So um, I was up there and I saw them. Um, but it's not too bad. I just try to go up there whenever I can. I just don't want to be kind of, I think, around a bunch of people. I think that's what I'm trying to limit myself. Like, But I know my family is taking it super serious and they're quarantined at home. So I know I can go around them and kind of, uh understandably be comfortable um but you know i'm just i try to stay at home as much as possible i think i go to the gym and to the grocery store that's pretty much it and then i just hang out around the house how good have the warriors been about making sure that you have plenty of things to do health and nutrition all those things and, and are you guys doing these zoom calls with each other yeah um they actually just texted us earlier we have one tomorrow um it's like kind of kind of like yoga, but kind of like a, a small like body weight lifting thing that we'll do together. Um, and then we have like uh, like every other week we'll do a check in and just have everybody get on there and just kind of say what they're what they've been up to or where they're at. Uh, so they've been really good with it, uh, just as far as keeping us updated on what, what what's going on or you know uh, giving us workouts or asking us if we need anything. Um, I personally never really need anything. I try to do things on my own. So when they ask me, it's always just the same answer. I just say, yeah, I'm okay. I'm chilling. Um, but no, they've been really, really, really focused, I think, on trying to make sure we're all healthy and ready to come back whenever that might be. So they really actually have a trainer that fires up a call and you guys all work out in front of the cameras? 
Yeah, uh, they get all of our strength coaches on there. Actually, it's all of them. So they'll they'll be on there with us, and then they'll they'll do it with us. Marquise, I know there's a story that Steph had to build a hoop during quarantine. Have you had access to a hoop? And what kind of basketball specifically? When's the last time you picked up basketball? Do you get to work out with a hoop and get some shots up? Um, I work out every couple of days in in San Francisco. I'll uh, I'll drive to SAC and work out with my trainer. Um, and then we had found a gym in Burlingame. So me, Kai, uh, JP, we're all able to go up there. And we, the uh, one of my friends from Tacoma plays for USF. So he brought a bunch of his teammates, and we kind of just had like an open gym. Um, but I try every few days, man. It, it, it sucks because it's 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 hard. You play basketball your whole life now. Everybody's telling you like you just got to stay inside and you can't really do much. But um, we're actually going to go work out later on. We're just going to get some shots up. But I just try to shoot as much as possible. I mean, it is hard because it, you can't really find a place as, as conveniently as you used to be able to, but just try to make it happen. So let's talk about your journey a little bit for people that don't know the Marquise Chris story, because mm -hmm. you went to the University of Washington. You were there for a year, drafted eighth pick by the Suns. And uh, you were there for a couple of years, dysfunctional organization, traded to the Rockets, then traded to Cleveland, three teams, three years, then signed as a free agent by the Warriors, and then had this resurgence with Golden State. But I'm wondering, I saw a quote from Steve Kerr from back before training camp started. Uh, did you realize that he just considered you, oh, but this is just like a, a camp body, that as opposed to what he later described you as, which is, long-term piece for this franchise what was your yeah. mindset going in did you know that they're they're not expecting me to do anything here um i kind of but not really i mean i went there and i think everybody tries to be optimistic you know you're just like hey i can see myself playing a lot and you know contributing and, and doing what i do for a team but i think for me it was kind of just up in the air that i was just going there really to give myself an opportunity to show that i could be a professional i think um you know, because you, you go to a championship organization, you know they're not going to really take any nonsense from somebody coming on the training camp deal. So um, I think it was more so just me showing that I belonged and that I was in a position where I, I could succeed. Um, you know, because I, I wasn't sure whether or not it was going to be in Golden State. You know, obviously when I went there, I was like, I would love to be here. Um, but I think just going to training camp and, and going to the preseason, it was really just me trying to put myself in a position to – you know, be successful anywhere, really. I think that was the, the point of me going there, is that I understood that, that they would put me in a position that I could showcase what I was capable of doing still. And, um, you know, even just the things be, beyond the court, you know, uh, the narrative that, that, that's out, that was out there, I would say, um, about me. I just wanted to, to rewrite that and change how people looked at me. And I, I think they gave me the opportunity to do that. And I'm still trying to just keep working for that. And I only really did a part of the story because – just the Warriors part of the transactions uh, could take a long time, but I'll just buzz <laughs> through it because you didn't know whether you're going to have a roster spot. It came down to the last spot. You got it. Alfonso McKinney uh, was let go at that point. Then you're starting to get more minutes as the season progresses, but they run into a numbers problem and then they have to waive you again uh, so they could sign Damian Lee. Then they bring you back on a, on a two-way deal and eventually guarantee the guy. This is like a roller coaster of emotions. It's got, it had to be just crazy for you at every twist and turn to go, oh, okay, all right, I can deal with this. I mean, emotionally, yeah. this – because you're a lottery pick a few years ago. Yeah. Um, I think for me the biggest thing that, that made it bearable was that there was, a, uh, there was transparency. I think they were honest with me from the get-go. Um, you know, about what it was. And they told me from training camp, they were saying that I would have to earn it. Um, and then I think after I earned it, it's just we kind of built a bond and they, they were honest with me about everything. And I knew before anybody really knew that I was probably going to get waived. Um, and I was okay with that. I mean, I understood why it was happening. I understood that it really wasn't like a choice that anyone made or that it was something that, you know, I kind of earned or deserved. You know, I just think it's something that had to happen. Um, and I've said it before that I, I'm glad that it did, to be honest, because everybody won in the end. Um, Damien got paid. I got paid. So it, it, I think it benefited everybody uh, the way that it should have, you know. You know, obviously, selfishly, for reasons, you just be like, man, I don't want to get waived. I don't want to 
be looked at as the guy who got cut. But I really don't care. You know, I, I was I was waved. I'm sitting at home. I get up off the couch and I get to play the next day. You know, so I think that uh, the relationship that they they helped build and it just showed that they cared about me more than just you know a commodity. Um, and that was really the first time I think in my career that I've had somebody tell me what things were, you know, ahead of time. You know, most of the time I find out things as they're happening. Um, or just or don't Twitter. find out at all. Yeah, or just don't find out find out at all until it happens. Um, so, you know, I think just, just for them to let me know ahead of time at least made me feel human. You know what I mean? Like, I was able to, to cope with it and understand, like, hey, I can prepare for this because I know it's happening. I'm not going to be blindsided by anything. I think when you look at the full career you've had so far, people forget you're only 22 years old. So, I mean, coming from what I believe you described as a dark place to now finding your happy place, how much is kind of yeah. betting on yourself really led to that joy that you're now finding? Uh, I think all of it. I mean, even from when I left college, uh, when I left college, I was projected like 20 something, uh, you know, late first round. And I just, I bet on myself. I, I, I locked in, I worked out, I did things that I was supposed to do, and I put myself in a position to succeed. Um, so I think it wasn't anything new for me. You know, I've been counted out. I wasn't ranked super high. I was ranked in high school, but it wasn't, you know, where I honestly think it should have been because I know I was better than a lot of players who, you know, might have been in front of me. Um, but, you know, I think that, that it, everything happens for a reason. Um, and, you know, I, I'm thankful for everything that I've been through. I'm thankful for, for the positions I've been put in. Um, just because it helped me grow, you know, and it helped me truly appreciate where I'm at now. You know, I don't think I would, honestly, if I would have came here earlier, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be a different person. You know, I don't think that I would have been ready to handle the situations that I've been put in, uh, you know, in the past year, even though that, you know, I think they helped me grow. I just think as I was 19, 20 years old, I really didn't know how to be an adult or how to handle situations and uh, adversity as well. Um, you know, I think I'm just continuing to try to grow. And I think betting on myself was probably the biggest thing there just because I, I understood what I was capable of doing and I knew I had a lot more to give. And, um, you know, I just – I felt that that I wasn't done yet. And I, I think I've shown that. I'm going to read you a quote from a popular TV show. Tell me if you know what this is from. When okay. it comes to Marquise Chris, you effed up, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I forgot his name. I, we, they showed this in the film, and I just I just gave him a jersey back. John Oliver, last week yep. tonight, right? Oh my goodness! No, I appreciate him though. I didn't know, I I didn't know who it was, and then I saw it, and I'm just like, I was surprised he knew who I was. Um, because I feel like he's pretty big time. After I looked him up, I was kind of uh looking into it, but huh. I don't want to really say much about what he said, but it was funny. I appreciate him for the support. <laughs> Did that mention though of you in that positive light in that situation on that kind of stage really kind of part the storm clouds in any way for you? Cause it's really been all yeah. up from there. Absolutely. I think um, that was kind of where I think, I guess I could say my image started trending in an upward way, you know, uh, for probably the past three years, I've just been the angry kid who gets technicals and things like that. Um, so, like I said, I've just been trying to change that narrative and just make it more positive um, just because I know who I am. So, I think for him to give me that support and, you know, put it out there, I think it just kind of put everything in, in, in the direction that it should be going. Marquise, you talk about timing and, and being here now. And obviously this year with all the injuries, a lot of young guys had to step up maybe in roles they didn't think they were going to get all the playing time you guys got. But when you were coming back and Steph was coming back, you had Wiggins, you had a, maybe a 20-game stretch where you were in a build to what you received last year. How disappointing was it for the season to be cut off when you had Steph coming back, Wiggins, and kind of what you guys were going to be? Obviously, at Clay next year. But the timing and where you guys were going, I mean, we last talked, you were dunking on people in, in the, against the Sixers on ABC, and then all of a sudden – I mean, it was weird. I just think it was, it was super surreal because it was just like everything was – it was so positive, everything's going in the right direction. And then it just kind of seemed like everything stood still. Um, and it was just, it was weird. You know, we, we came to the arena and had to have a meeting and things like that to, it's basically like our exit meetings. Um, and nobody really knew, it was just a lot of uncertainty. So I think it sucked because everything was being, everything was positive for us. I think, you know, we were playing well, everybody was starting to come back um, and, you know, even though it didn't translate it to, to 
a bunch of wins as we would like. I think we 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 like the way that we were trending. You know, I think that we all saw what we were capable of doing, and we understood that. You know, when Steph gets back, it's a different different basketball game as well as play. Um, you know, and then like you said, we added Andrew, so I think that that just it added a different dynamic to our team that you know I think we needed. Um, and then we're going in a super positive direction, and I don't think that that's going to stop. I think that we're just going to continue to grow. Um, you know, because obviously we are a young team, but we're, we're full of talent, I think. And, and we're a team that, you know, when we're gelling, you know, I don't think there's very many people who can guard us all the way around. So, uh -oh. question here, because we're, we're waiting to find out what the NBA plans to do. Uh, right. There's a possibility that your season is over already and that uh, they're just going to take the top teams and go straight into the playoffs. Uh, Mark Cuban's got a proposal on a play-in scenario. They're, everybody's got a proposal. But uh, have you mentally prepared yourself for the possibility of, of playing maybe five more games and going into the biosphere? And who are you taking into the biosphere? Is there somebody <laughs> special you want to go? You know, you might be able to take a family member or, you know, the, nobody knows what the rules are at this point. Have you thought about yeah. it at all? No, nah, I really haven't. Um, I mean, I probably wouldn't take anybody, to be honest. I, I might just be by myself and, and stay on my lonely. I, I wouldn't really know who I would take. Uh, but I, I, hope, I hope we're able to play. I think that's what I want. I want to be able to come back and play for our fans. You know, I want everybody to be as safe as possible. You know, obviously I want us to, to play the game that we love, but I also want everybody to be able to be safe and um, – you know, it sucks just because it's up in the air. Nobody really knows what's going on. But I think as professionals, we're prepared to come back and play. Um, you know, but I think as people, everybody's kind of more cautious and, and on edge about it. But, you know, I think what's going to happen, it, whatever's going to happen, I think is going to be at the best interest of both, you know, looking out for health and looking out for, for the game of basketball. So, like I said, I'm, I'm ready to come back and play if, if that's the case. Um, so I'm just looking forward to it. Even if it was only a handful, happen. even if it was only a handful of games. Yeah, I mean, I'll come games. back and play one game. I just want to play. I, I miss it. Um, I miss the energy. I miss just being around my teammates, being in the gym. So I want to ask you and go back a little bit to that moment where the Warriors had to wave you because mm -hmm. I remember talking with some people in the organization, given how well you were playing at the time, and I thought, oh, this guy is gone. So some playoff team is going to pick him up. The way, I mean, 6'9", six, 6'10", six, jumps out of the gym, uh, you know, so much energy. Look at what he's doing. And then, you know, days started to go by, and I'm like, nobody's picked up Marquise Chris yet. And I just – I envisioned you in hiding somewhere, not answering the phone, telling your agent, I'm not – don't tell him, like, I'm out of the country. I can't be found. I want to stay with the Warriors. I'm just going to – just going to go cloak and dagger here. Did you do that? I mean, did you, did you – were you answering calls from people? Because teams had to be interested in you. Uh, personally, I didn't answer any calls, but I don't – I told my agent from the get-go that I wanted to stay uh, stay in Golden State. Um, so I kind of felt like I was hiding, but I wasn't really hiding from anyone. I was more so just, you know, at the house. But I told him that this is where I wanted to be, and I understood that. By me being here, I think it would help me be the best me possible, um, you know, with the coaching staff and with the players and, you know, just the organization as a whole. So, you know, I was nervous to leave. I didn't really want anybody else to, to take me anywhere. You know, I wanted to come back here because I, I felt like I was going to be in a position to succeed. So, um, yeah, I was, I was open with my agent from the get-go that I told him what he had to just do whatever he had to do to get me back here. Um, you know, he did that, and I think things worked out the way that they were supposed to. I just envision you uh, responding to every call or text with, you know, who this new phone? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, nah, I'm not like that. Somebody's okay. call, I'll answer, but I just, I feel like the relationship that I had with this organization was, it was beyond basketball, I think. You know, doubling down on that, the Warriors have the worst record in the NBA yet you want to come back and play. Nobody wants to leave this team. So can you put your finger on the difference from a chemistry standpoint? What is it about this team? I know they went to five straight finals, but what is it about this organization, that this, this chemistry that makes it so that guys like you can thrive here and that people don't yeah. want to go anywhere? I mean, it's not the first time I've been on a team with the worst record in the NBA. But, um, <laughs> I Hello, mean, I, Suns. 
<laughs> I love being here, man. I think just the energy that 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 they bring um, is super positive. You know, I think that they 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 make it enjoyable to go to work. You know, um, just being around them every day. You know, they they treat you like humans, and you go in there, you don't feel like it's it's a job or like oh, I'm just going here because I have to. You actually genuinely want to be around everybody. Um, and I think that's a testament to the chemistry that the that Steph and Draymond and Clay bring to the team, you know, because the camaraderie that they have, um, you know, it's contagious. I think everybody, they, we care about each other, um, you know, from coaches all the way down to the trainers and to our strength coaches and everybody, you know, everybody's a family, everybody's in it together. And, you know, we all want to see each other succeed. Speaking of those guys, I know that you've been on the other end of their uh, wrath when they're fully healthy. And <laughs> yeah. when you look at this organization, I mean, do you ever watch film? Do you ever kind of think of the games that you saw them play and start picturing how you're going to really be a building block part of this team with all these guys healthy? You haven't all been on the court at the same time. Yeah, no. I mean, I caught myself maybe like a week ago. I literally just watched Steph highlights maybe for like an hour. It just happened to pop up on YouTube. While I was, I'm just going to watch it. And it was just crazy. I'm sitting here watching it, and I just was envisioning myself, like, where I'll be at. And, you know, when he passes the ball, he doesn't stop moving. So he, he passes it, he gets it right back, and he shoots it. Um, and just the way that he wants to play, I like being a big in that system, you know what I mean? And I think that that's the way that I can play, um, the way that I have been playing. So I think when he gets back, it's just going to be different. I think I don't think there's going to be much, you know, lack of communication just because everybody kind of is just watching Steph. So we all kind of just play off him. Um, and he makes it easy for everyone because he's not a selfish player, you know. He passes the ball. He screens. He does everything that, you know, a, a good teammate does. That being said, Marquise, do you ever watch Marquise Chris highlights on YouTube? And what's the best yeah. poster you've ever put out there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, if somebody tells you they don't watch their own highlights, they're lying. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I watch mine. Um, probably the one last year on Jared Allen. Uh, or last, this season on Melly in New Orleans. Um, that was That's probably my favorite dunk ever. But I've missed a lot of good dunks in my life where I wish I would have made them because they would have been up there. But the ones that I've made, that those are probably the two of my favorite dunks. If you could uh, posterize Wilt Chamberlain, what would that mean to you? Well, I mean a lot. I mean, big as hell. <laughs> so I, I, I hope I could one day. I, I saw an article where you talked about if there was one guy in history you could play with, you pick Wilt. Why is that? Yeah. I mean, just he was such a dominant player. Um, you know, I think the way that he affected the game, you know, I don't think that there's really any players like that. Uh, you know, to be that big and that dominant, you know, I feel like if you gave Katie's skill to Taco, I feel like that's what we'll be looking at is he would be that big and just be dominating the game crazy. Um, but, you know, I just – I don't know. It's just different. I feel like I've never really played with another big like that. Um, so I wish that I would be able to. I wish that I would even be able to witness it, you know. Um, yeah. Shaq in his prime was close. For sure. That's uh, not really fair, though. I just feel like that's a big bully, man. He's too big. <laughs> <laughs> well, so was Wilt, though, especially against yeah. the guys he was playing against. I mean, it, you know, that's like – that's a Mack truck, man. That's a big yeah. Mack truck. <laughs> yeah. I mean – Standing next to Shaq, I remember uh, doing an interview with him, and I just was like, wow, I've ne never seen anybody that's, like, this massive and this yeah. athletic. I mean, so when you know, there's a lot of guys that are big but, you know, not in shape, and he was just like, whoa, this, how would you even begin to deal with him? It's uh, a problem. Uh, but that's actually a good transition to the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is what might have been, because uh, if not – for one tackle, I think when you were in eighth grade or something like that, you yeah. could have been the next Gronk up in El Pro. <laughs> you could have yeah. been Gronk. Do you ever think about that? I do. I do. But I I personally don't think my body is meant to be hit like that. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm a big target, man. So I, I don't – I think it happened for a reason, and I'm glad it did, to be honest, because um, – I think I'm built for basketball. I think my body and, and the way that I play, I'm a basketball player. But I definitely would love to play football. Just one game, I think, just to see. Um, but nothing more than that. Just one game. Maybe one play. I don't even know. One play? Game. Yeah, maybe just one play, man. Because if I get hit too hard, I'm going to get mad and I'm not going to play. 
What what if they they put you in for one play and it was a running play you had to block? That'd be awful. <laughs> That'd be terrible. <laughs> Tell the backstory of what happened because your mom was the one that said, "All right, football's over. This is done." Yeah. So um, she told. I started playing when I was in fourth grade, going into fifth grade, um, and she was just. She told me straight up. She said, "The first time you get hurt, you're done playing." And I was like, "All right, fine." Like. And I hadn't ever gotten hurt. Like, I'd had little little injuries. Like, I broke my finger and just didn't say anything. Um, but it was – we had one pass play for me. The whole playbook, we had one pass play. So, I'm wide open, and my teammate overthrows me. And I'm going to catch it like this, and I reach out, and dude trips me while I'm reaching out for it, and I fall on my shoulder and broke my collarbone. <sighs> End of what could have been an all-pro – for sure, but football career. I think I think my mom knew it was best. She told me she she just she's happy she did what she did. I don't think anything else should have happened differently. You know, I wish I didn't have to break my collarbone to to know that I should have been playing basketball. But um, it is what it is. I'm yeah. thankful for it. Yeah, I think your mom was right though. I mean, she comes to all your games, doesn't she? Yeah, no, she comes to every game. I don't think she's missed a game this year. Maybe maybe one or two because she had to work. Uh, but no, she she comes down for every game, and she'll stay the full game, and then say bye, and then she'll she'll drive back. So she's making missions. I mean, how special is that though? That she can just hop in the car and just cruise on out and watch you play anytime. No, it's amazing because uh, I mean, she's probably seen as many games this year as as she's seen my whole career. Um, just because I've been kind of far, uh, especially like when I was in Cleveland, that's just way too far. But she came to a lot of games when I was in Houston. Um, and in Phoenix, she came and would stay, uh, stay with me. Uh, but it's different. It's just I, I can have my family there. My sister hasn't ever really been able to come to my games, and now she can. Uh, my little brother as well. So I think I'm thankful for it. It's different having my family be accessible, I think, now. So I'm not really used to it. Um, but I just try to embrace that I get a lot of time with them, you know, and just thankful for it because, you know, you never know how much time you have in one place in the NBA. Now, I was thinking, you know, the flip side of that is of all the sports there is, I mean, I think basketball and probably football lose the most without the fans. So how bizarre do you think it would be to really play an actual NBA game in an empty arena? Uh, I think it would be weird. I just think because we feed off the energy from the crowd a lot. Um, you know, and I think you can feel the momentum of the game kind of shift back and forth just by being in an arena full of fans. Uh, so I think it'd be different, but I think it's going to just show people's true appreciation for basketball. You know, it's going to, it's going to be the true grit and passion of basketball. You're not really going to hear anything but us. Um, so I think it's going to be different, but it's going to be something that I think we'll be able to adjust to. Um, it's just going to be weird. I think that first game, those first few games are going to be a little weird. That being said, who's uh, who's got to watch their mouth on the court? Because if you can just hear you guys, Draymond. what kind of trash talk is going on on the court? Draymond. <laughs> I, I might have to a little bit, but I, I've, I've calmed down. Draymond definitely has to. If he's mic'd up, it might be trouble. <laughs> uh, we were at an event a couple months ago uh, called Beyond the Baseline, and you were there with some of the kids. And mm -hmm. actually, you're quite the artist. Uh, we were talking about jerseys, and the Warriors have some great jerseys, but you drew one out. Can you tell the fans about your uh, – your artistic ability? Uh, I just draw for fun. I mean, I don't, I don't ever really think that I've had any artistic ability. I think I just doodle a little bit. Um, I took art class in like second grade or third grade. Uh, but I liked my jersey. I actually wanted them to keep it. Um, it, had, it was like kind of like a Splash Bros theme. It was pretty dope. I don't even know. I might have it at my house still. I think they gave it to me when I left. Did I get it when I left? You were supposed to. I remember looking at it, and I was like, this this could be sold. You could make some money from yeah. Nike. Yeah, I, really I think, nice I, I, think I took nice. it. Just explain the design to Casey and Larry, because it was like so, a Splash Brother theme, alternate jersey. Yeah. It was like like the – it said GSW on the front, and it kind of mm -hmm. like looked like water droplets dripping off of the name. Like the name kind of looked like it was melting, but it was like water. Um, yep. And then kind of like my Miami Heat logo with the basketball on the net. Yep. But it had like it was like water instead of flames, like going into the into the basket, and it had like the number in the basketball, like as it was in the net. I thought it looked pretty dope, though. Yeah, and it took you about ten minutes. <laughs> it was pretty yeah, good. Yeah, for sure. I think if I'd have had some time to really sit there and think about it, I'd have been able to do it better too.
<laughs> I want to get your insights since you have lived it and talked about how when you first came into the league and, and so young, what would you do with the one and done rule? Because that's the path that you followed and, you know, you end up on, on a team with not a great organization and they didn't know what to do. And, you know, you're just trying to find your way as a teenager, really. Do you, are you supportive of the one and done or, you know, do you want guys to be able to come in now? Now they've got the new experimental uh, deal like uh, that uh, Jalen Green is, is doing among others where, you know, you can play for actual real money in an right. organized professional league sanctioned by the NBA. Do you think that's the best of both worlds here? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it should be on a case by case basis. You know, I think that there are definitely kids that, are ready to be professionals and can handle it. And, you know, um, honestly, there's some kids that aren't, you know, and I was one of the kids I don't think that I was at the time. Um, and I think college helped me grow up a little bit, but I think um, there's definitely kids who are talented enough to keep up and, and, and be in the NBA and, you know, contribute. Uh, and, you know, by just going to college for eight months, it's not really going to change much. Um, so, you know, I respect the kids that, that are going and doing the G League route and doing the things that they think that they're ready for, um, you know, because to each his own. You know, everybody feels that they are ready and everybody feels that they should be a pro and should be getting paid. Um, but, you know, the, the, the truth about it is that everybody's not, you know. Um, but I think that those kids that, that are choosing to this year, I think that they're going to show that there are kids that actually are and that they can do their thing and, you know, represent for themselves. I think uh, – What's the kid's name from OKC, Baisley? I think he did the same thing, didn't he? I thought he went to the G League. and. Uh, There's a few kids. There's a few guys. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, it, it, it works out for people because he's contributing. He's doing his thing. So, um, like I said, I just think it's a case-by-case -case basis to where you have to see and truly uh, acknowledge whether or not you are ready to, to handle that. So I was going to ask you, you are around every day when you're with the Warriors, not right now, but when you're actually practicing and with the team, like legendary figures in the game already with Steph and Clay yeah. and Draymond and, and Steve Kerr. So I probably could guess the answer is going to be Draymond, but who have you drawn the most from and, and just kind of let their greatness sort of rub off on you, so to speak? Yeah, I mostly would say Draymond. I think Draymond is, is like that for everybody. I don't even think I had to really – reach out to him. I think he just kind of embraces everyone, you know. Um, but I talk to Steph a lot, too. Steph's just quieter. I think Steph is more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, type of person where you, you go to him and you can have conversations with him about anything, really. Um, but Draymond is the type of person I think that you can say something whenever and you're going to get a response and get, like, a genuine answer back. So I think I've had a lot of conversations with Draymond throughout this season that even beyond basketball, like, you know, he loves talking about the business of basketball. And he's told me a lot that, you know, I really didn't know at the time, um, you know, and it would be hard to just pick apart like one individual thing that he said, just because he's always trying to drop knowledge on everyone. Marquise, last one from me. Did you watch the last dance? what did you think of it? And what did you think of coach Kerr's uh, performance in the last dance? We had him on a couple weeks ago. He said he was nervous. What was going to be unearthed in that documentary? Yeah. I think Steve Kerr's the real goat. <laughs> um, nah, but it was amazing, man. I think it was a lot of things that I didn't really know uh, was happening at the time. You know, I was born while all that stuff was happening. So um, I think it's cool to kind of go back. I like history things and documentaries uh, anyway. So I think just seeing the relationship that, that he had with his team. Uh, I said this the other day. He kind of had like, like a Draymond type of energy, or you could say Draymond has his type of energy. Um, so it's just super passionate and, you know, you can say you either love him or hate him, but you'll always really respect what he says, um, you know, because, you know, ultimately he just wants to win and he wants the best from everybody. Yeah, pretty crazy that he actually punched Jordan, though. I mean, like. He did. I respect him. I respect it. We talked about it before. He, we, uh, it was a few of us. This was when D'Lo was still on the team. We, we went up and talked to him about it and he just started laughing and he just said he didn't know that, uh, he didn't realize that the camera crews were there, but I don't think they, they put the uh, – I don't remember seeing it. I might not have been paying attention, but I don't think they had video footage of it. Yeah, no, they didn't. Uh, believe me, we, we've been looking. We were looking. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to find it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, nobody touched Steph, though. Nobody touched Steph. Uh, nah, uh, hell no. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't want to do that. That's, that's a, that's a one-way ticket out of town. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. So, 
So you mentioned earlier that you've got these team workouts and team yoga, uh, yes. sort of. So give me your pose. What's your pose? Your uh, What's your best pose? What do you got? Child's pose is definitely my favorite pose. We just, me and my friend uh, from Tacoma just did yoga outside. Uh, it's hot, but we did it. But I like child's pose. Uh, what else? I like pigeon. Pigeon helps my hips a lot. Yeah. Um, I think those are the main ones that I think I need, really. Yeah. Cobra's Pigeon. okay. It's a lot. Cobra? Yeah. It's just a lot on my lower back sometimes. Yeah. I I have lower back and hip issues, so uh, Pigeon <laughs> is a good one. No, it's, trust me, you get a little older and it's uh, – Man, I feel it now. <laughs> <laughs> you, want to trade, you want to trade bodies? I'll go for that. Uh, anyway. No, I would keep mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's a good call for you. It's gonna be it's gonna be hard for you to defend uh, centers in the league at uh, at a shade under six feet tall. It's gonna be it wouldn't be, rough for you. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be good. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I can't wait till we actually see you in person again on yeah. a court when it's safe. And, uh, and, you know, we can actually see you doing your thing because uh, it, was, it was enjoyable watching your rise and the crazy path and now hopefully smooth sailing from here on out. Thank you. I appreciate you guys for having me, man. Uh, it's our pleasure. All right, stay safe, stay healthy. Best to your family. I know you got a lot of brothers and sisters, so everybody just do the right thing, stay safe, yeah? I appreciate you. You guys stay healthy, too. With authority.